Welcome, everyone. I'm your host, Emerson Green. So, Sean Carroll, physicist and author of The Big Picture, has a go-to argument that works like a skeptical Swiss army knife. Whether your target is the soul, or the afterlife, or even psychokinesis, this one argument can do it all. So it starts with a dramatic-sounding claim. The laws underlying the physics of everyday life are completely understood. He's defended this claim in a series of blog posts, lectures, interviews, and published papers. There's also a t-shirt. According to Dr. Carroll, this isn't as ostentatious of a claim as it may sound at first blush. The macroscopic objects we interact with are composed of atoms and acted on by familiar forces, and we know how those particles and forces work. Sure, we don't understand the full theory of quantum gravity, but we understand it perfectly well at the everyday level. In his blog post, The World of Everyday Experience in One Equation, he says, quote, No experiment ever done here on Earth has contradicted this model. In another post entitled, Seriously, the laws underlying the physics of everyday life really are completely understood, he adds, Electrons obey the same equations of motion, whether they are in a rock or in a human heart. End quote. So the argument is roughly, you are made of atoms. We know how atoms work, and atoms work the same way, regardless of what larger structure they constitute. And for that reason, there's just no room for anything beyond the materialism he advocates. We can discard any notion of an immaterial mind that's causally connected to the body. Likewise, we can cast aside more radical parapsychological claims without the annoying business of investigating the subject too closely, since we already know it must be wrong. Carroll's view seems to be that this argument, if successful, would rule out a raft of possibilities at once. Of course, he recognizes that science is tentative, nothing is ever certain, and there can be future revolutions in our understanding of nature. He's not claiming to have ruled out anything with absolute certainty, nor is he claiming that physics is somehow complete. Rather, the domain of physics relevant to everyday human life is well established enough that we can say with a very high degree of confidence that there is nothing non-physical, paranormal, or supernatural at work in our world of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Dr. Carroll thinks we should conclude that the natural phenomena of our world Everything from brains to social systems are entirely constituted and determined by the microphysical, given the empirical success of the core theory. Basically, if there were any forces, entities, etc., that exerted a causal impact on the everyday physical world of spoons and fleshy organisms, physicists would have found experimental evidence of their influence by now. According to Carroll, it's completely implausible that, quote, the laws of physics that have been tested by an enormous number of rigorous and high-precision experiments over the course of many years are plain wrong in some tangible macroscopic way, and nobody ever noticed. Much more likely, he says, those who think they have something that contradicts the laws of physics, relevant to everyday life, have probably just done some careless research, fallen prey to confirmation bias, or trusted unreliable testimony. So here's a summary of the argument from the abstract of Carroll's paper the quantum field theory on which the everyday world supervenes. Quote, Effective field theory, EFT, is the successful paradigm underlying modern theoretical physics, including the core theory of the standard model of particle physics plus Einstein's general relativity. I will argue that EFT grants us a unique insight. Each EFT model comes with a built-in specification of its domain of applicability. Hence, once a model is tested within some domain of energies and interaction strengths, we can be confident that it will continue to be accurate within that domain. Currently, the core theory has been tested in regimes that include all of the energy scales relevant to the physics of everyday life, biology, chemistry, technology, etc. Therefore, we have reason to be confident that the laws of physics underlying the phenomena of everyday life are completely known. So I want to emphasize, I want to make a little bit of an argument, a very, very, very little bit of an argument for the statement made in red that we know how atoms work. The point is that the laws of physics, we don't know all the laws of physics by any stretch of the imagination, but those laws of physics that are relevant to the atoms in your body, we know all of the laws of physics that far. There's no room for new laws of physics that would affect how the atoms in your brain actually work. That's a very subtle statement. So I could, you know, I think that uh, Dan mentioned I had three hours to give this talk, so I'll... <laughs> 
So, but I, I would get tired if that happened. So I would give you the whole explanation for the laws of physics, how they came to be, why we're confident. But instead, I will just intimidate you in submission by showing you an equation. So, <laughs> in this one equation are summarized all of the laws of physics necessary to understand the atoms in your brain at the energy, mass, and length scales relevant to your everyday lives. We have quantum mechanics, we have space-time, we have gravity, we have the other forces, electromagnetism and the nuclear forces, we have the matter, the electrons and the quarks of which you are made, and we have, of course, the Higgs boson we, we discovered. Higgs boson fans also, uh, two years ago. Um, the point is, again, there's plenty of room in the laws of physics for other stuff. We don't know how black holes work. There's plenty of things we don't understand. I'm not saying that physics is done. I'm a physicist. I know it's not done. I'm not going to retire soon. <laughs> but we know enough to say that if there are any other forces, particles, fields, phenomena, they can't affect the atoms in your brain because either they're so weak that they would have no effect on what the atoms are doing, or we would have found them in experiments. Those are the only two options. So to no, no one ever understands me when I say this, so I'm going to say the same thing over again. Here are the caveats to this statement. I'm not saying we understand all of physics. I'm not saying that there's room for no new discoveries in the non-everyday world. I'm not even saying we know how the fundamental laws come together to make complicated macroscopic things like frogs and ecosystems and uh, spiral galaxies. There's enormous amounts of work to be done in understanding how science works. But we have an underlying framework, which we call quantum field theory, as Dan mentioned. And quantum field theory is either true or false. All the evidence says that it's true. And if it is true, then there is no room for new physics that can, buy, that can in any way affect what goes on in the atoms in your brain. We understand what they do. There is therefore no room for the information that is you to persist after you die. He uses this argument, I'll call it the argument from the core theory, in a million different contexts, many of them related to consciousness. He uses it to argue against the afterlife, the soul, psychokinesis, levitation, panpsychism and against far more specific philosophical views like the idea that rationally responding to one's value judgments or conscious inclinations is a fundamental form of causation. Like I said, Swiss Army knife. Lest I be accused of strawmanning, before I go into criticizing the argument, let me take one more stab at explaining the chain of reasoning here. Why do defenders of the core theory argument think it rules out, say, an immaterial soul? Well, dualists typically believe that the soul has causal effects on the body. The body is made of atoms, but the dualist is telling us that atoms behave differently as a result of the influence of the soul. Imagine if we chose a subatomic particle to ignore completely in all our experiments. Our predictions wouldn't pan out since we're ignoring a particle that exerts a causal influence on what we're observing. And yet, this isn't currently happening even though we are ignoring this influential soul stuff. If we just removed any mention of protons from our standard model of the stuff that exists in our everyday world, what we observe in experiments would stop making sense because protons make a difference. Mental substance is a very physically influential substance. It supposedly makes a difference. So you'd think there'd be some physical evidence for it. The reply is that dualists only think mental substance makes a difference in certain macroscopic systems. Their view doesn't predict that we would see its influence in the microphysical world when it's not a part of those macroscopic systems. When was it ever a part of the dualist view that the soul would influence the events in a particle accelerator? The idea that actually needs to be defended is that atoms behave the same way regardless of what larger system they constitute. That is what's in dispute. In other words, what needs to be defended is microreductionism. On microreductionism, what a human being does is ultimately fixed by the fundamental particles making them up, and the behavior of the fundamental particles making them up is entirely determined by the basic laws of physics. As Carroll put it, electrons and other particles obey the same equations whether they are inside a rock or inside a human brain. So that is the crucial step, and it can't be tested in a particle collider. If we're trying to figure out whether atoms behave in the same way, in microscopic and macroscopic systems, you can't just test the microscopic systems. 
If there are novel entities or forces or causal principles that only arise at higher levels of organization and complexity, the microphysical and isolation is going to behave the same way regardless. So before we can dig deeper into why the core theory argument is flawed, we need to grasp a division Carroll makes between weak emergence and strong emergence. Weak emergence is compatible with, if not just another name for, reductionism. But strong emergence is anti-reductionist. In philosophy, strong emergence is often just called emergence, but we'll stick with Carroll's slightly non-standard use of terms here. As he said in 3AM magazine, I think emergence is absolutely central to how naturalists should think about the world and how we should find room for higher level concepts from tables to free will in a way compatible with the scientific image. But weak emergence, not strong emergence. That is simply the idea that there are multiple theories, languages, vocabularies, ontologies that we can use to usefully describe the world, each appropriate at different levels of coarse graining and precision. I always return to the example of thermodynamics, fluids, energy, pressure, entropy, and kinetic theory, collections of atoms and molecules with individual positions and momenta. Here we have two ways of talking, each perfectly valid within a domain of applicability, but with the domain of one theory, thermodynamics, living strictly inside the domain of the other, kinetic theory. Crucially, the emergent higher-level theory can exhibit features that you might naively think are ruled out by the lower-level rules. In particular, thermodynamics famously has an arrow of time, defined by the second law, entropy increases in isolated systems, whereas the microscopic rules of the lower-level theory are completely time-symmetric and arrowless. I think this example serves as a paradigm for how we can connect the manifest image to the scientific image. Sure, there's nothing like free will anywhere to be found in the ultimate laws of physics, but that's not the only question to ask. At the higher level description, we should ask whether our best emergent theory of human beings includes the idea that they are, in the right circumstances, rational decision-making agents with freedom of action. Until we come up with a better description of human beings, I'm perfectly happy to say that free will is quote-unquote real. It's not to be found in the most fundamental ontology, but it's not incompatible with it either. It's simply a crucial part of our best higher level vocabulary. End quote. In a future episode, I want to really dig more into the poetic naturalism defended in Carroll's book, The Big Picture, because it's really interesting. For now, we just need to understand that strong emergence is not kosher, but weak emergence is central to Carroll's worldview. As he puts it, little things can come together to make big things, and those big things can often be successfully described by an approximate theory that can be qualitatively different from the theory of the little things. End quote. For example, an atom is just a collection of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Atoms emerge, in the weak sense. The language of atoms is just a convenient way of talking about collections of subatomic particles. It's the same stuff that was already there prior to the formation of the atom. So there's been no ontological addition to the physical world when subatomic particles come together to make atoms. Weakly emergent phenomena don't involve anything over and above their constituent parts. Strongly emergent phenomena, by contrast, involve novel entities or forces or powers that arise at higher levels of complexity and organization, such that the new behaviors couldn't be derived from the individual behaviors of the constituent parts of the system. As Philip Goff elaborates, strong emergentists believe that certain complex systems, such as conscious brains, have novel causal capacities that could not be predicted from knowledge of their basic components. Imagine a superintelligence, of the kind imagined by Laplace, who has total knowledge of the particles and fields covered by the core theory at time t, and tries to work out the state of my brain at t plus 1, solely on the basis of the core theory. If strong emergence is true, that superintelligence will make some false predictions about the locations of the particles in my brain at t plus 1 as it is relying entirely on the core theory, and is ignorant regarding the contribution of the emergent causal capacities of my brain. End quote. So, if you make an argument for microreductionism, you've made an argument against strong emergence. Carroll makes an argument for microreductionism, the argument from the core theory. In a nutshell, we've been looking long and hard at the physical world with advanced technology, running experiments in particle accelerators that test the effects of extant particles and forces, 
and anything strong enough to exert a causal impact in the domain relevant to our everyday world, which is what's claimed by dualists, parapsychologists, etc., would have been noticed by now. Either A, it doesn't exist, B, it exists but it's too weak to produce the effects claimed, or C, it's strong enough to produce those effects, and there should be physical evidence of its influence on the material world. But we don't see those effects, so it must be A or B. So what's the problem with the argument? The problem with the argument is that the experimental evidence cited does not actually support micro-reductionism. Strong emergence would work roughly like this. Natural laws, which exist in addition to the ones currently well understood, describe novel entities or forces or powers or causal principles that apply at higher levels of complexity, but only at those higher levels of organization. So testing the lower levels of organization does nothing to cast doubt on the existence of these other natural laws, causal principles, etc. The microphysical would behave in the same way whether there was strong emergence or not. This is not some kind of ad hoc adjustment to the theory, tailored to dodge the evidence. It is just straight up not a part of the theory that the microphysical world being tested in particle colliders would behave differently as a consequence of laws that only apply to higher order systems. You just didn't understand the emergentist position if you thought this was some kind of knockdown argument. So it's sometimes asserted that conservation of energy, that energy cannot be created or destroyed, rules out strong emergence. Since strong emergence seems to be an example of the total amount of energy in a system increasing. But as David Papineau explains, quote, the conservation of energy in itself does not tell which basic forces operate in the physical universe. Are gravity and impact the only basic forces? What about electromagnetism, nuclear forces, and so on? Clearly, the conservation of energy as such leaves it open exactly which basic forces exist. End quote. So long as emergent mental forces operate in such a way as to pay back all the energy they borrow and vice versa, Papineau argues, they have acted conservatively. Adding fundamental forces or causal principles does not mean violating conservation. It doesn't really even mean that physics is wrong. The laws underlying everyday life are true as far as they go, they're just incomplete. Moreover, Nancy Cartwright has argued that physical laws involve an implicit ceteris paribus clause. The laws of physics specify what will happen, all things being equal. And in the cases we've been discussing, all things are not equal. If Cartwright is correct about the semantic point, then those who reject micro-reductionism are not really even departing from the predictions associated with quantum mechanics. But even if you disagree with her view that the laws of physics specify what will happen all else equal, strong emergentists can just embrace the alternative. Supplementing, or expanding, the inventory of the natural world is a far cry from simply saying physics is wrong. In The Conscious Mind, David Chalmers uses the analogy of electromagnetism to quell potential worries about modifying physics. Quote, in a way, what is going on here with consciousness is analogous to what happened with electromagnetism in the 19th century. There had been an attempt to explain electromagnetic phenomena in terms of physical laws that were already understood, involving mechanical principles and the like, but this was unsuccessful. It turned out that to explain electromagnetic phenomena, features such as electromagnetic charge and electromagnetic forces had to be taken as fundamental, and Maxwell introduced new fundamental electromagnetic laws. Only this way could the phenomena be explained. In the same way, to explain consciousness, the features and laws of physical theory are not enough. For a theory of consciousness, new fundamental features and laws are needed. This view is entirely compatible with a contemporary scientific worldview, and is entirely naturalistic. On this view, the world still consists in a network of fundamental properties related by basic laws, and everything is to be ultimately explained in these terms. All that's happened is that the inventory of properties and laws has been expanded, as happened with Maxwell. Further, nothing about this view contradicts anything in physical theory. Rather, it supplements that theory. End quote. The crux of the issue, to reiterate, is that the success of the core theory doesn't get you within a mile of micro-reductionism. The experimental conditions in which we've tested the core theory do not include complex biological systems. So, contrary to what is often asserted, we have not been given strong empirical grounds to reject strong emergence in the brain. As Carroll himself admits, 
quote, Particle physics experiments typically examine the interactions of just a few particles at a time. So new physical laws that only kick in for complex agglomerations of particles are not necessarily ruled out by the data we currently have. Surprisingly enough, in his 2021 reply to Philip Goff in the Journal of Consciousness Studies, he concedes this crucial point which seems to undermine his entire case. So let's read what he says in context, since it is such a major concession. Quote, One is, of course, free to contemplate whatever extravagant deviations from contemporary physics one likes. Particle physics experiments typically examine the interactions of just a few particles at a time. So new physical laws that only kick in for complex agglomerations of particles are not necessarily ruled out by the data we currently have. It's worth noting, however, how profound a departure such laws would represent. The most fundamental principle of quantum field theory is locality. Fields at any one point in spacetime are only influenced by the values and derivatives of other fields at that same point, not the behavior of fields at other points. Modifying the dynamical equations in ways that were sensitive to the complexity of a configuration of surrounding particles would represent a dramatic overthrow of this principle. End quote. An overthrow I can tolerate, but a dramatic overthrow. I can see an overthrow. Departing, I mean, sure. What's wrong with departing? I mean, let's depart. Who hasn't departed? But, I mean, a profound departure. It's gone too far. I mean, this all seems a little bit less convincing than the slam dunk it's usually presented as. Besides, the worries about modifying physics are overblown, which was part of Chalmers' point. We're supplementing. We're adding to the inventory of nature to best explain the data. Okay, Emerson, didn't Carol try to argue the core theory just stipulates that it applies in biology? Yeah, so look, it is... Sure, the core theory does does rule out strong emergence. Fine, the core theory does rule out strong emergence. But my point is, if your starting point is experiments of particle physics and this philosophical evidence for strong emergence, the rational thing to do is look for a theory that accommodates both, and you're not going to be led to the core theory. You're, you're not going to be led to something a million miles. You're going to be led to a modified version of it, where locality is is in a more limited domain of applicability and sure i mean he actually in his paper responding to my book he actually suggests some ways in which the core theory could be modified to allow for strong emergence um so i think you'd be led to that i mean it would be different if as i say this is not just saying oh we're going to accept the philosophy hell or high water you know w- w- empirical evidence counts for nothing the point is these are not conflicting the evidence from particle physics experiments can't possibly cast doubt on strong emergence because thinking in Bayesian terms, you would not expect strong emergence to be evident if you're just talking about dealing with small numbers of particles. By definition, it emerges in complex systems. As Goff put it elsewhere in a reply to Carroll, Carroll is right that the strong emergentist is obliged to do some serious theoretical work. But this theoretical work could be conceived of as explaining how the causal capacities of strongly emergent wholes interact with the causal capacities of particles slash fields to co-determine what will happen. Understanding strong emergence in this way gives us a response to Carroll's novel argument that, quote, based on purely physical grounds rather than consciousness-based motivations, our expectation that the laws of quantum field theory might break down in biological organisms would be very low indeed. Maybe so, but we should think of strong emergence not as quantum field theory breaking down, but as a new neurobiological theory kicking in. And the place to look for when emergent neurobiological principles kick is not physics, but neurobiology. People get very excited about brain scans, but in fact they are very low resolution. Each pixel of an fMRI image corresponds to 5.5 million neurons, between 2.2 and 5.5 times 10 to the 10 synapses, 22 kilometers of dendrites, and 220 kilometers of axons. We are only 70% of the way through putting together a complete connectome of a maggot's brain, with its 10,000 neurons. The idea that we know enough about the workings of the human brain with its 86 billion neurons to know whether or not its workings involve strong emergence is not credible. End quote. Suppose a biologist discovers what she thinks is an indispensable law of biology but it's not clear how it could be reductively accounted for, so she adopts the idea that this is a strongly emergent law of nature, one that only applies to biological organisms. 
Why would you run to a particle accelerator to test that hypothesis? Strong emergence doesn't lead us to expect any effects at lower levels of organization and complexity, so it doesn't count as any evidence against the theory that we don't see any effects at lower levels of organization and complexity. If there are strongly emergent laws of nature involving, for example, biology, then studying the microphysical world for their effects makes about as much sense as studying a rock formation. It is just not a part of the theory that you would see any effects there. Surprisingly enough, Carroll seems to concede this point. But, you know, you don't want to be radically departing or profoundly departing or dramatically overthrowing, things of that nature. The strong emergentist claim is not that these new causal principles, which are over and above the basic laws of physics, have nothing at all to say about the behavior of matter composed of protons, neutrons, and electrons. That is not the claim. The claim is that these new causal principles have nothing to say about the behavior of protons, neutrons, and electrons in isolation, or when they are not a part of a specific higher-order system or process. If there are laws that only apply to macroscopic systems and processes, then I'm afraid you have to observe those macroscopic phenomena. There's no shortcut here. The argument from the core theory does not establish micro-reductionism. Thank you for listening. I've been Emerson Green, and I'll see you next time.